This is the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter, 2022. Welcome to Lesson 11, Jesus, Author and Perfecter of Our Faith, ready for teaching on March 12. It's from the series In These Last Days, The Message of Hebrews. Our author is Dr. Felix Cortez, the Associate Professor of New Testament Literature in the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University. And I'm your reader for today, Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, March 5. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus is not just our Saviour, he's not just our judge, but he is the one who intercedes for us, that each of us can have eternal life. And as we study more about that great gift that he offers us this week, as we study about Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us and that you'll bless us in our personal lives, in our relationships with others, and with our ability to share your love and grace with those about us. And today I'd like to pray specifically for anyone listening from Toowoomba in Queensland, from Warsaw in Poland, or Bulawayo in Zambia, or Durban in South Africa, or Kelowna in Canada, or Florianopolis in Brazil, or Kathmandu in India, or even in Osaka, Japan. Heavenly Father, we know that people from all of these countries listen to this podcast of these beautiful lessons. And I pray that today each of us may gather together around your word and be blessed through your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's read that again, Hebrews 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hebrews chapter 11 and chapter 12 are probably the most loved chapters of the book. They describe the Christian life as a race in which we all participate and in which all who stay faithful will receive the reward. They also describe the drama of redemption as a race in which people of faith from the past persevered despite sufferings but have not yet received the reward. And that's because the story ends with us as well, not just them. We are the concluding act. The drama culminates with our entering and running the last part of the race, and with Jesus seated at the goal line at the right hand of God. He provides inspiration as well as the ultimate example of how the race is run. He is the ultimate witness that the reward is true, and that he is the forerunner who opens the way for us, as we read in Hebrews 6, verses 19 and 20. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 23. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us, through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Hebrews 11 explains that faith is confidence in God's promises, even if we cannot see their fulfilment yet. This lesson will explore what faith is and how it is obtained through the examples of the past, and especially and centrally through the example of Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Hebrews 12 verse 2.
Sunday, March 6. The righteous will live by faith. Read Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 to 39. What is God saying to us in these verses? Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any one draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Endurance is a characteristic of God's end-time people, without which they will not be able to receive the promises that we read about in Revelation 13.10. He who leads into captivity shall go into a captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. And Revelation 14 verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. In order to endure, however, believers need to hold fast their faith. As you read in Hebrews chapter 10, 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And Hebrews 4, 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Paul has shown that the desert generation was not able to receive the promise because they lacked faith, as you read in chapter 3, verse 19. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Hebrews portrays believers as also at the threshold of the fulfilment of the promises in Hebrews 9:28 so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly await for him he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation in Hebrews 10 verse 25 not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And verses 36 to 38. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any one draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. And as needing to exercise faith, if they want to receive the promises, we read in verse 39, but we are not of those who draw back to petition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Paul introduces his exposition on faith with a quotation from Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 2 to 4. Let's have a look at that. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 2 Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold, the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. Habakkuk had asked God why he tolerated the treacherous people who oppressed the righteous in chapter 1 of Habakkuk, verses 12 to 17. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die, O Lord. You have appointed them for judgment. O rock, you have marked them for correction. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look at those who deal treacherously, and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he. Why do you make men like fish of the sea, like creeping things that have no ruler over them? They take up all of them with a hook. They catch them in their net and gather them in their dragnet. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they sacrifice to their net and burn incense to their dragnet because by them their share is sumptuous and their food plentiful. Shall they therefore empty their net and continue to slay nations without pity? 
The prophet and his people were suffering. Thus, they wanted God to act. God answered, however, that there was an appointed time for the fulfilment of his promise, and they needed to wait, as we read in chapter 2, verses 2 to 4. Habakkuk and his people lived, like us, between the time of the promise and the time of its fulfilment. God's message continued in Hebrews, He who is coming will come and will not delay, in Hebrews 10.37. And that was also in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 3, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. The message refers to Jesus. He is the righteous one, the embodiment of faith, who pleases God and provides life, as you read in Hebrews 10, verses 5 to 10. So beginning at verse 5, Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, To do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Why then would he delay? He won't. He already has come to die for us, as you read in Hebrews nine fifteen to 26 And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded. Commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no remission. Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And he will surely come again at the appointed time, as we read in Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. And Hebrews ten twenty five we read before, talks about that. God's message continued in Hebrews 10.38, My righteous one shall live by faith. Paul states the same in Romans 1.17 and Galatians 3.11. Romans 1.17, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith, and Galatians 3.11, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. 
Romans chapter 1 verses 16 and 17 is especially enlightening because it explains that the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Let's read that. Romans 1 beginning at verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith. What Paul means is that God's faithfulness to his promises comes first, and his faithfulness produces as its result our faith and or faithfulness. Thus, because God remains faithful to his promises, as we read in 2 Timothy 2.13, the righteous in response to God's faithfulness will remain faithful as well. 2 Timothy 2.13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. And so to finish the day, why is it important to recognise that our faith results from and feeds on God's faithfulness? How can we learn more to trust in his faithfulness to us and to the promises he has made to us? Monday, March 7. By faith, Abraham. Hebrews defines faith as confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Hebrews 11.1 1 from the New International Version. Then it provides a list of faithful people from the history of Israel who exemplify what faith is, and it shows how they manifested that faith by their deeds. Read Hebrews 11, verses 1 to 19. What did these heroes of faith do that exemplified their faith? How were their actions related to the hope of things not seen? Hebrews 11, beginning at verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he, being dead, still speaks." By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him." By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world, and being heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, for he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore from one man, and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland, and truly 
If they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Abraham is probably the most important character in this chapter. Abraham's last act of faith is especially instructive regarding the true nature of faith. Hebrews notes that God's instruction to Abraham that he offer Isaac as a sacrifice seemed to imply a contradiction on God's part, as we read in verses 17 and 18. Isaac was not the only son of Abraham. Ishmael was the firstborn of Abraham, but God had told Abraham that it was all right for him to accept Sarah's request and cast Ishmael and his mother out because God would take care of them and because Abraham's offspring would be named through Isaac, as we read in Genesis 21, verses 12 and 13. But God said to Abraham, Do not let it be displeasing in your sight, because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. For in Isaac your seed shall be called. Yet I will also make a nation of the son of the bondwoman, because he is your seed. In the next chapter, however, God asked Abraham to offer Isaac as a burnt offering. God's instruction in Genesis 22 seemed to flatly contradict God's promises in Genesis chapters 12 through to 21. Hebrews concludes that Abraham amazingly solved the conundrum by arriving at the conclusion that God would resurrect Isaac after he had offered him. This is amazing because no one had yet been resurrected. It seems, however, that Abraham's previous experience with God led him to that conclusion. Hebrews 11.12 notes that Isaac was conceived by the power of God from one who was as good as dead. Paul also noted that despite Abraham's being as good as dead and Sarah barren, Abraham believed in hope, against hope, that he should become the father of many nations, because he believed that God gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist, which we read about in Romans 4, verses 17 to 20, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who, contrary to life, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken. So shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Thus, Abraham must have assumed that if God in some sense already had given life to Isaac from the dead, he could do it again. In God's leading in the past, Abraham saw an intimation of what he could do in the future. And so to finish the day, why is meditating on how God has led our lives in the past so crucial for maintaining our faith and trust in Him now? Tuesday, March 8, Moses Believing in the Unseen Read Hebrews chapter 11, verses 20 to 28. What did these men of faith do? How are their actions related to hope? 
and to things not seen. Hebrews 11, beginning at verse 20, By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them." Moses is the second major example in this chapter of faith. The life of Moses is introduced and concluded by two actions of defiance to the king. His parents hid him when he was born because they were not afraid of the king's edict, as you read in verse 23, and Moses left Egypt not being afraid of the anger of the king in verse 27. The most significant action of Moses was, however, that he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, in verse 24. The reverence to Moses' adoptive mother as Pharaoh's daughter suggests that he was slated to be the next Pharaoh. Moses, however, was willing to leave behind the prospect of becoming the ruler of the most powerful nation at that time, and to become instead the leader of newly freed slaves, refugees actually. Compare Hebrews chapter 11 verses 24 to 27 and Hebrews 10, 32 to 35. What were the similarities between the situation of the original recipients of Hebrews and the experience of Moses? Hebrews 11, beginning at verse 24. By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. And chapter 10, verses 32 to 35. But recall the former days of which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings. Partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me in my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward." The greatness of Moses was that he was able to see beyond the promises of the king of Egypt and look toward the unseen, namely the promises of God. Hebrews says the key was that Moses' sight was fixed on the reward, not on the riches of Egypt. This reward is the same reward mentioned in Hebrews 10.35, which God has promised to all who believe in him. Paul's words about Moses' decision must have echoed powerfully in the hearts of his original readers. They had been enduring reproaches and insults because of their faith in Christ. They also had been afflicted and lost their possessions, as we read in verses 32 to 34 of chapter 10. Some were in prison, as we read in Hebrews 13.3. In parallel sense, Moses chose to be mistreated with God's people, exchanging the wealth of Egypt for bearing the insults associated with Christ, because he believed that the reward of Christ was greater than whatever Egypt would offer.
And so to finish the day, what are some of the struggles that you have faced because of your faith? What have you had to give up for it? Why ultimately is the reward worth it even if you can't see it now? Wednesday, March 9, by faith, Rahab, and the rest. Read Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31, and Joshua 2, verses 9 to 11. Why was Rahab, a pagan prostitute, included in this text of sacred biblical characters? Hebrews 11, 31, by faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. And Joshua 2, 9 to 11, and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in any one because of you, for the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Rahab is probably the most unexpected character whom we find in Hebrews chapter 11. Rahab is one of two women mentioned by name. She is the tenth in the list, the first being forefathers and patriarchs of Israel, and each one is regarded as being righteous. When we come to her, we find that she not only is a woman, but also a Gentile prostitute. The most surprising thing is that she also is the thematic centre and climax of the chapter. The list is organised in a unique way. Each entry begins with the repetitive use of the phrase, by faith. The basic pattern is, by faith, so-and-so did such-and-such, or by faith, such-and-such happened to so-and-so. This repetitive pattern increases the expectation in the reader to hear the climactic assertion that, by faith, Joshua led the people into the promised land. But that's not what the text says. Instead, Joshua is passed over, and the prostitute takes his place. After the mention of Rahab, the repetitive pattern ends abruptly with, And what more shall I say? in verse 32. Let's read the whole of verse 32. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, and also of David and Samuel and the prophets. Then... Paul hurriedly lists some names and events that he does not explain in detail. Rahab's deed of faith was that she heard, believed, and obeyed, even though she did not see. She did not see the plagues of Egypt, or the deliverance in the Red Sea, or the water flow from the rock, or the bread descend from heaven, yet she believed. She was a good exemplar for the audience of Hebrews who did not hear Jesus preach or see him do a miracle, and for us as well, who did not see any of these things either. Ellen White writes in Daughters of God, page 35, Rahab was a harlot who lived on the wall of Jericho. She hid the two Israelite spies sent to check out the defences of that city. Because of her kindness to them and her declaration of belief in God, the spies promised that the lives of Rahab and her family would be spared when the attack came on Jericho. End of quote. Paul then continues in Hebrews chapter 11 verses 35 to 38 with a list of the hardships many faced. 
the phrase refusing to accept in verse 35 implies that they had the possibility to escape but chose not to because their sights were set on the reward of God. Hebrews 11, beginning at verse 35. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trials of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. And so to finish today, though we have not seen any of these things happen, the six-day creation, the exodus, the cross of Christ, why do we have so many good reasons for believing that they did? Thursday, March 10. Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Read Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. What do these verses ask us to do? Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. The climax of the exposition on faith really arrives with Jesus in Hebrews chapter 12. Paul started the letter with Jesus, who is the coming one, and who will not delay, in chapter 10, verse 37, and Paul concludes with Jesus, the perfecter of our faith, in Hebrews 12, verse 2. Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith, as we read in the New American Standard Bible. This means that Jesus is the one who makes faith possible and is the example who perfectly embodies what a life of faith is all about. With Jesus, faith has reached its perfect expression. Jesus is the founder, we read in verse 2, or author or pioneer of our faith in at least three senses. First, he is the only one who finished the race in its fullest sense. The others talked about in the previous chapter have not yet reached their goal, as we read in Hebrews eleven thirty nine to 40 And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Jesus, however, has entered God's rest in heaven and is seated at the Father's right hand. We, together with these others, will reign with Jesus in heaven, as we read in Revelation 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years." Secondly, it was actually Jesus' perfect life that has made it possible for these others to run their race, as you read in Hebrews 10, 5-14. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do your will, O God. Previous saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. 
Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. If Jesus had not come, the race of everyone else would have been futile. Finally, Jesus is the reason we have faith. As one with God, he expressed the faithfulness of God toward us. God never gave up in his efforts to save us, and that is why we will reach the reward in the end if we don't give up. Jesus ran with patience and remained faithful, even when we were faithless. As you read in 2 Timothy 2.13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Our faith is only a response to his faithfulness. In the end, Jesus is the perfecter of faith because he perfectly exemplifies how the race of faith is run. How did he run? He laid aside every weight by giving up everything for us, as you read in Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. He never sinned, ever. Jesus held his sight firmly on the reward, which was the joy set before him, that of seeing the human race redeemed by his grace. So he endured misunderstanding and abuse. He stared down the shame of the cross, as we read in Hebrews 12.3, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Now it is our turn to run. Though we can never achieve what Jesus did in our own strength, we have his perfect example before us. And so, by faith in him, and keeping our eyes on him, as have the others before us, we press on ahead in faith, trusting in his promises of a great reward. Friday, March 11. From the little book Steps to Christ, page 70, written by Ellen G. White, we read, By faith you become Christ's, and by faith you are to grow up in him, by giving and taking. You are to give all, your heart, your will, your service, give yourself to him to obey all his requirements, and you must take all, Christ, the fullness of all blessing, to abide in your heart, to be your strength, your righteousness, your everlasting helper, to give you power to obey. End of quote. And from the same little book, page 105, God never asks us to believe without giving sufficient evidence upon which to base our faith. His existence, his character, the truthfulness of his word are all established by testimony that appeals to our reason. And this testimony is abundant. Yet God has never removed the possibility of doubt. Our faith must rest upon evidence, not demonstration. Those who wish to doubt will have opportunity, while those who really desire to know the truth will find plenty of evidence on which to rest their faith. It is impossible for finite minds fully to comprehend the character 
or the works of the Infinite One. To the keenest intellect, the most highly educated mind, that holy being must ever remain clothed in mystery. Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? It is as high as heaven. What canst thou do, deeper than hell? What canst thou know? Job 11, 7 and 8. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. An early Christian scholar once wrote, Credo ut intelligum. Latin for, I believe, in order that I may understand. Hebrews 11.3 says that, by faith we understand. What is the relationship between faith and understanding? Why does faith often come before understanding? That is, why must we sometimes reach out in faith in what, at least at first, we don't understand, and then afterwards, more understanding will come? Question 2. The Greek word pistis means both faith and faithfulness. Why are both meanings important in seeking to understand what living by faith means? How did the people in Hebrews 11 show by their faithfulness the reality of their faith? How can we do the same? And question 3. Though we understand that faith is a gift of God... What role do we play, if any, in receiving and maintaining that gift? Romans 12 verse 3 reads, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each a measure of faith. Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Worshipping Like Jesus and it's by Andrew McChesney. Three years ago, the 13th Sabbath offering helped establish a community centre to reach people in Cambodia. But the community centre, an urban centre of influence, reached its first person before it even opened. Koi Sapoan heard that construction work had started on the Essential Life Centre and that the wages were fair, so he asked project manager Gary Rogers for a job. Gary, a US missionary who works for Adventist Mission, had no immediate openings at the site in Batambang, Cambodia's second largest city, so he took Sapoan's phone number. Sapoan returned a few months later and Gary, learning he had welding and bricklaying experience, told him he could start work the next day. Why wait until tomorrow, Sapoan said. I can start now. Sapoan, a leader in his own Christian church, was surprised to learn that Gary began every workday with a 30-minute worship. He had never held a job with worship and he liked it. As the group studied, he realised that things he was learning from the Bible were different from what his church taught. One morning, the worship focused on the seventh-day Sabbath. Sapoan read in Luke 23 about Jesus dying on the preparation day, the sixth day of the week, and being buried before the sun set for Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. He saw that the disciples stopped their work for the Sabbath and that Jesus rested in the tomb. It wasn't until the first day that they brought spices to anoint his body. Surprised, Sapoan told himself, then the seventh day truly is the Sabbath. Seeing Sapoan's belief, Gary asked, Do you want to be like Jesus? Sapoan didn't hesitate. Yes, I do, he said. If that is your desire, join us as we open the Sabbath together next Friday evening, Gary said, inviting him to an Adventist gathering. Sapoan came on Friday and returned the next day for Sabbath worship. He was amazed at how people greeted one another saying, Happy Sabbath! Happy Sabbath! It made him feel that God could make him holy. As Sapoan learned more about God, he began to return tithe. 
On Sabbath afternoons, he joined church members in helping the needy. He was baptised 18 months after starting to work on the construction site for the Essential Life Centre. And there's a photograph of Sir Poen right here on this page. Thank you for your 13th Sabbath offering that helped open the Essential Life Centre, an urban centre of influence at Batambang, Cambodia. Be sure to share this podcast of the Sabbath School lesson with your friends. Invite them to tune in every week. And may God bless you in your personal life. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind, and it is written. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. Remember, God is always faithful.